Good afternoon, everybody. A quick announcement for anyone who uh, was hoping to attend the youth uh, section meeting on urban public health, which couldn't take place this morning due to confusion over rooms. Uh, this has been rescheduled for four o'clock this afternoon and can ask you please to meet at the registration desk. But welcome to Glasgow. This is very exciting for me. I feel very privileged. Uh, this is a, a beautiful conference center, a huge stage that's used for multiple purposes. Last time I was this close to the stage, I had a backstage pass to a Bob Dylan concert. And one of the audience mistook me for Tom Petty. Uh, some of you are probably too young to know who Tom Petty is. I don't see it myself. The other reason why I'm uh, so pleased to be doing this is because I've been to every public health conference, and before that, I've been to every UFA conference. I see this in a lot of ways uh, as my conference. I don't mean ownership, I just mean a conference that I'm very attached to. I don't have any proof that I was in Maastricht in 1993, but here is the dinner in Copenhagen in 1994, and unless I'm mistaken, that's either me or Tom Petty. And we know that this is factual because it was published in a, a reputable journal. The theme of the conference, reducing inequalities in health and healthcare, uh, very important to Glasgow and to Scotland. We're very grateful to our partners and sponsors um, for this conference, particularly the European Commission, but we've also received funding from the Scottish Government and from Glasgow City Council. These are not charitable organisations. They know that if they get people to come to Glasgow and that if they have a good time here, there's a good chance they'll come back. So your job over the next few days is to enjoy Glasgow. Scotland in general, and Glasgow in particular, are noted for high mortality rates and inequalities in mortality. The Commission on the Social Determinants of Health brought to international attention the low life expectancy at birth in one district of Glasgow, Carlton, compared to countries such as India and the Philippines. The London Health Observatory produced a map of London underground showing how male life expectancy fell by five years along the 10.5 kilometers from Westminster to Canning Town. Jerry McCartney subsequently produced this Glaswegian version and showed a 14 year difference in life expectancy over a distance of just eight kilometers. So what causes such pronounced inequalities? The answer is straightforward, deprivation. Glasgow stands out with 64% of the population, two thirds of the population of Scotland's largest city, living in areas that are in the most deprived fifth for Scotland. These are the ones shown in dark red on this map. Why are inequalities important? Well, the WHO definition of public health is public health refers to all organized measures, whether public or private, to prevent disease, promote health, and prolong life among the population as a whole. I think we can all agree with that. We'll emphasize that last bit among the population as a whole. We don't leave anyone behind. All groups, so no inequalities. Over the next few days, you'll be seeing some extremely interesting talks, record number of abstracts, over a thousand abstracts submitted. We expect this to be a very high quality conference. You will have time to think about some of these issues, to talk to people. I have some questions that if you have an idle moment on your hand, you may wish to consider.
firstly, uh, and the first three are taken from uh, some uh, publication of Sally McIntyre's. So firstly, what are inequalities in health and what causes them? What do we know about what works to reduce inequalities in health? What do we know about what is likely to reduce inequalities in health? And then two, I've taken the liberty of adding, what are the effects of the recession and of austerity on inequalities in health? And finally, particularly for Johan, if mortality rates among the rich have fallen by 58% over 30 years, as they have in Scotland, why have mortality rates among the poor only fallen by 37%? Is this a failure of public health? In your conference bag, you should have found a charity quiz. This is our charity event this year. We, uh, in Malta, people were swimming, in Brussels, people were cycling. We exercised the brain in Glasgow. The quiz, uh, the charity we've chosen is something called Starter Packs Glasgow, which is a small local charity one mile away from here, south of the river. This provides household items to individuals and families in need, describe themselves as offering a hand up, not a handout. Our suggested entry fee is one pound. The quiz sheets, as I say, are in the conference bag. If you can't find one, go to the University of Glasgow stand in the exhibition center. Completed sheets and money should also be returned to the conference stand by 11 a.m. on Saturday. We have magnificent prizes on offer. Um, please do take part. You can cheat, you can use the internet. We don't care, we want your money in. We're looking for 250 people. We have a record turnout at the conference. We've got 1,500 people registered. We're looking for 250 of you to take part. The difference that 250 pounds can make to a small local charity in its work against inequalities is considerable. So please do take part. Now, I'm delighted to have the job of introducing Johann Mackenbach to open the conference, um, mainly because he needs no introduction. If you do think he needs an introduction, you're probably at the wrong conference. Um, Johann is a professor of public health and chair of the Department of Public Health at Erasmus University Medical Center in Rot Rotterdam. And he's a world leader in the field of social epidemiology social epidemiology. So I'll hand the floor over to him. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair, for introducing me and for inviting me to give this first plenary presentation. And you've asked me to uh, do something of an appetizer. So I've tried to come up with a positive message. And I hope you will forgive me for uh, ending up with such a positive message uh, today. And my presentation is about reducing health inequalities in Europe, and this is a topic that is haunting us for some time. Were you already present in public health in 1985? I was. I was delighted by this um, target that the World Health Organization set, an inspirational target to be reached by the year 2000, but as nothing much happened, the World Health Organization felt compelled to renew that pledge for the years after 2000. Again, reduction of health inequalities by one-fourth by 2020 in this case. And um, some people have gone even further. I'm sure you know this report of the Commission of Social Determinants of Health that has as its title, Closing the Gap in a Generation. That means reducing by 100%. So there's no lack of ambition in this area, and uh, the big question now for me here today with you is, are we on track to achieving something like such an ambitious target? And there is a surprising lack of systematic information on whether we are on track. So I'll try to uh, bring you up to date with some recent findings that help us to answer this question. What we do know is that inequalities in health measured on all aspects of health, uh, morbidity, mortality, 
uh, quality of life, that they are still very much present in Europe. And the data here on this slide come from a recent study that we've done in Rotterdam with colleagues around Europe that shows again that there is this big difference in mortality between people with a lower and a higher level of education or occupational class or whatever other measure you would like to take to measure socioeconomic position. And it also shows us again, as has been shown before, that these inequalities are largest in Central and Eastern Europe, smallest in Southern Europe and in between in the West and the North. So that's for sure, these inequalities are still there. Uh, but what's also for sure is that some countries have made serious efforts to reduce these inequalities in health. And foremost among these countries is England and Wales that has had a systematic and well-resourced strategy to try to tackle health inequalities, starting in 1997 with the rise to power of Tony Blair and lasting until 2010. And a few other countries have also implemented or tried to implement policies to tackle health inequalities, including Norway and Finland. So we might expect at least some positive effects of these policies. And what I'm trying to answer then is the question whether health inequalities in Europe have gone up or down over the past two or two and a half decades. And I've chosen this etching by the Dutch graphical artist Maurits Escher as an emblem for my talk. This is a, a fascinating graphical illustration of that going up or going down depends on your perspective. Is this man going up or is it going down? It depends on your perspective. According to some perspectives, he is, these men are going up, others, they are going down. And it's the same with health inequalities, as you will see. So are health inequalities going up or down? And that's a question that I'll try to answer using data from a project that um, is now going towards its end by the end of this year, the Dimitric project funded by the European Commission, in which we've been able to collect data on morbidity and mortality. I will only show you data on mortality by socioeconomic position for a 20 year period between 1990 and 2010. And the countries that are in the data that I will illustrate this afternoon are indicated by the stars here on the map. So that's uh, um, 10 countries for which we've been able to do this analysis with a good coverage of Europe. And the data allow us to look at inequalities in mortality by educational level and occupational class, two classical indicators of socioeconomic position. I will only show results for education because most countries have education, fewer countries have occupational class, but the results are very, very similar for occupational class. Now, let me answer the big question right away. Are health inequalities going up or going down? This is a slide with two graphs on the left hand side we see absolute inequalities in mortality, in this case by educational level, in the early 1990s and in this more recent period of 2005 to 2009. And we see the, the countries on the x-axis and we also see that uh, absolute inequalities seem to have been going down, whereas on the right-hand side, relative inequalities expressed as a rate ratio have been going up. The absolute inequalities are expressed here as a rate difference, the difference in the mortality rate, subtracting the rate among the high educated from that among the low educated. These are very simple measures. We've also done this with more sophisticated measures like the relative index of inequality or the slope index of inequality, and we see the same. Absolute inequalities are going down, relative inequalities are going up. That's what we see systematically for men. And for women, the picture is a bit similar, not exactly identical. Among women, what we see is that for absolute inequalities, there is a mixed picture. In some countries, inequalities are going down. In others, they are slightly going up. But relative inequalities are again going up among women as they do among men. So whether you say that inequalities are going down or up depends on the perspective chosen. Do you prefer to look at absolute inequalities or relative inequalities? That's what determines your answer. Now, what is behind these changes in 
absolute inequalities and relative inequalities is differential mortality decline. Differences in the pace of mortality decline between those with a higher and a lower socioeconomic position. And that's what's illustrated here for men on this slide. What we see on the left-hand side are absolute changes in mortality, differences in mortality expressed in deaths per thousand years between the first and the second point in time that we have, the early 1990s or the later point in time, 2005, 2009, and then for the low and the high educated, the low educated in blue, the high educated in red. And what we see on the left-hand side is that in most countries, uh, with the exception of Lithuania, which is a completely different world, I won't go into that during my presentation, all the other countries have a stronger absolute mortality decline among the lower educated than among the higher educated. By contrast, when we look at relative changes in mortality over time, percentage changes, for example, we see that relative changes are larger among the higher educated. And these can both be true because the starting levels are, of course, very different between the low and the high educated. Absolute declines are stronger, larger among those in lower socioeconomic groups in most countries, whereas relative declines are stronger among higher socioeconomic groups. That's what we systematically see happening over time. Now, this is juggling with figures. What, what does this mean in real life? First of all, I think the, the, the big thing to notice is that there have been remarkable reductions in mortality in lower socioeconomic groups. These are really very, very strong. They, they may be smaller, perhaps, from some perspective than in the higher socioeconomic groups, but they are very remarkable. And what is more, in absolute terms, they are often larger than those occurring in the higher socioeconomic groups. This must imply that mortality-lowering interventions or policies, whatever they have been, they have benefited lower socioeconomic groups. And despite the fact that we know that most interventions or policies have, tend to have a lower reach among the lower socioeconomic groups or a lower effectiveness. Despite that, these interventions have benefited lower socioeconomic groups. And when you start to think about how you could achieve a larger relative reduction in lower socioeconomic groups than higher socioeconomic groups, you soon become aware of the necessity for a massive redistribution of resources. Because if we just try to achieve equal access and equal effectiveness uh, for the lower as compared to the higher socioeconomic groups, the maximum that we can achieve is similar relative declines in mortality. If you want to have larger relative declines in mortality among the lower than among the higher socioeconomic groups, which would be required to narrow relative inequalities in morbidity or mortality, then one would have to spend much more effort in the lower socioeconomic groups than in the higher socioeconomic groups. And that's perhaps desirable, but it would require a massive redistribution of resources within our health systems. In the absence of such a massive redistribution of resources, I would argue that what is feasible is reducing absolute inequality in mortality. And what we see, I think, is evidence for a reduction of absolute inequality in mortality. Count your blessings. Now, of course, reducing absolute inequalities is important, as is absolute reducing relative inequality and mortality. I think both are important, and the challenge is to reduce both, or try to, if we reduce absolute inequalities, to keep relative inequalities as small as possible. And that's why I have plotted the results of the previous analysis in this two-dimensional graph, with the change in absolute inequalities on the horizontal axis, and the change in relative inequalities on the vertical axis. And here are the countries present in the analysis. And what we see is that almost all countries, at least for men, are in the upper left-hand quadrant of the figure, indicating that over time, their absolute inequalities have become smaller, but their relative inequalities have gone up. That's what you've seen before. But now, what I think is amazing to see is that at least on the axis of reducing absolute inequalities, 
there are a few countries that come close to this 25% reduction that the World Health Organization has pledged in 1985 and then repeated in the year 2000. But what we also see is that countries are very, very different in their performance. Some of these countries have been able to achieve a massive reduction of absolute inequality and mortality without raising their relative inequalities to a substantial extent. Spain is a good example of that, perhaps England and Wales. Whereas other countries, Norway and Finland particularly, they have seen no reduction in absolute inequality and mortality and a rise, a substantive rise of relative inequality and mortality. These are very, very contrasting experiences that we must try to understand. And in this study that we are, have been doing, we have tried to understand why these countries have so different experiences. Let me show you a few of the results, to, just to, to hint at what's behind this. This is a, a graph for England and a graph for Finland, and what we see here is, graphically, that the, the narrowing of inequalities that has occurred in England is not seen in Finland. Finland is doing much worse. It's a widening of absolute inequality and mortality in Finland, whereas there is a narrowing of these inequalities in England. Now, where does this come from? And it's actually tempting to think that this has something to do with the national program to reduce health inequalities in England that I referred to previously. But I don't think there, there is much evidence to support that claim. There have been a number of studies I've, I've also published on this topic that have shown that at the population level, the effects of this program have been modest or absent. There may have been some effects in specific subgroups of the population or areas, but at the population level, the effects have been quite modest. And actually, that's also what we see in our analysis. When we extend the period a bit longer, from 1980 to 2010, what we see is that England, the green line here, has had a reduction of absolute inequality and mortality at least since 1980. Whereas the other countries present here have seen less of a reduction in absolute inequalities and sometimes even a rise, like in the case of Norway. Now, can this have been an effect of Tony Blair's program to reduce health inequalities? Unlikely, because it started earlier. When did it start? It started under Margaret Thatcher. And that's, of course, also not the explanation. Uh, the explanation is in this graph. The narrowing of absolute inequalities in mortality in England is due to a very strong narrowing of inequalities in smoking-related mortality in England, much stronger than in any other country, which is due to the long-term decline of smoking that has occurred in England earlier than in other European countries. And as a result of that, the inequalities in total mortality in England are also narrowing more than in other countries. Now, the contrast between England and Finland has another explanation, actually, than smoking. Both Finland and England are benefiting from the long-term reduction in smoking, which reduces absolute inequality and mortality. One important explanation for the difference between the two countries is here, in this graph. Finland has seen a strong rise of inequalities in alcohol-related mortality. Alcohol-related mortality has gone up strongly in Finland, uh, particularly among the low-educated and the lower socioeconomic groups. And this has driven a widening of inequalities in total mortality in, in Finland to a much larger extent than in the case of England. Another country that is doing very well is Spain. Another country that is doing badly is Norway. Why is Spain doing better than Norway? Here again, we can find some clues by looking at specific causes of death. In this graph, you see on the left-hand side a number of specific conditions contributing to mortality, cardiovascular conditions and ischemic heart disease, for example. And in Norway, there has been an enormous decline of ischemic heart disease mortality, which has benefited the lower socioeconomic groups much more than the higher socioeconomic groups. So that's good. That has been more than in Spain, but in Spain, mortality from ischemic heart disease or cardiovascular disease was already much lower among the lower educated in the lower manual classes than it was in Norway. 
So that doesn't explain the difference. The difference is actually explained by what happens, again, to smoking-related mortality, where there is a narrowing of inequalities in Spain and a widening in Norway, and mortality from conditions amenable to medical intervention, conditions like tuberculosis or cervical cancer or stroke that have become amenable to medical intervention, where mortality has declined, and where we see that Spain has been able to narrow the gap in amenable mortality much more than Norway. And what this analysis of the underlying conditions that explain the narrowing, less or more narrowing of absolute inequalities tells us is quite amazing actually, that these trends are driven by downstream factors in the health inequalities jargon, smoking, alcohol consumption, access to medical care, are seen as downstream drivers as compared to the more upstream factors like uh, the resources that are differentially distributed by socioeconomic position like income or wealth. In these patterns of changes over time and differences between countries and changes over time, what we see is a very strong influence of these downstream factors. We see a strong decline of ischemic heart disease that helps the mortality gap to widen, to, to, to narrow. We see strong declines of smoking-related mortality in the lower socioeconomic groups. Strong declines of mortality from amenable conditions in the lower socioeconomic groups. And then in some countries we see as a setback an absence or, or a strong increase of alcohol-related mortality. And if that's absent, then that also helps to narrow absolute inequality of mortality. Now let me try to go one step further in, in, in interpreting what we are seeing. And I, I'll go through these four downstream influences one by one. Why and how did ischemic heart disease decline? And how did it decline so strongly in the lower socioeconomic groups in most Western European countries? It is because of behavior change and it is because of improvements in medical care. That's for sure. That has been demonstrated in many studies. Now, how have many countries been able to have that benefit also in the lower socioeconomic groups? Partly because some of the behavior change was also there in the lower socioeconomic groups, but the studies that have been done show that this has been mainly the result of a access and quality of medical care that has allowed these new interventions to reduce mortality from ischemic heart disease, to reach people, patients, people at risk for ischemic heart disease in the lower socioeconomic groups. Access and quality of medical care have been key for this decline in low socioeconomic groups. Where does this long-term decline in smoking among lower socioeconomic groups come from? This long-term decline is now helping to narrow absolute inequalities in mortality, as I've shown you a moment ago. And this is due to efforts to reduce smoking. That started not in 1990, when the inequalities started to narrow, but long before that, in the 1970s and 1980s. And while we know that modern tobacco control efforts they, they don't really help to reduce inequalities in smoking. In the longer term, all that we've done to reduce smoking is now paying off in terms of a, a reduction also in smoking rates among the lower educated and the lower socioeconomic groups that now helps to narrow inequalities in mortality. This setback from alcohol-related conditions, where does it come from? It's seen in a, in a few countries, not in all. It's not seen in the Mediterranean countries like France, Switzerland, Spain and Italy. We see a narrowing of inequalities in alcohol-related mortality in these countries, but we see a widening in several of the Nordic countries, and we also see a narrowing to, to somewhat less extent in England and Wales. From the studies that have been done on these un unfortunate rises in alcohol-related mortality, particularly in lower socioeconomic groups, it, it, um, they have shown that this is related to a greater affordability of alcohol and the relaxation of alcohol control policies in a number of Nordic countries. And then finally, how were countries able to achieve such strong declines in amenable mortality in lower socioeconomic groups? This would have been impossible without some degree of equality of access and quality of medical care in lower socioeconomic groups. And while no specific policies may have been pursued to try to achieve that, the fact that we have created healthcare systems that allow at least 
some degree of equality of access and quality of care, also for people who have less money to spend on healthcare, I think has helped enormously to reduce these inequalities in mortality from amenable causes. Now, I've talked about downstream factors, and I think it's, it's really striking to see how strongly their influence has been against the background of what has been happening in our societies. I've just taken this single slide to illustrate these trends. I'm, I'm sure you recognize this rock star who has shown convincingly the, the enormous rise of income inequalities and inequalities in wealth that have occurred in the past 20, 30, 40 years in many Western European countries. And against this background of more unfavorable inequalities in these upstream risk factors, it is even more surprising to see inequalities in mortality, at least on an absolute scale, narrowing because of all these effects of downstream risk factors. Imagine what would have occurred if income inequalities and inequalities in wealth would not have gone up, as shown by Piketty. That brings me to three conclusions that I offer to you to contemplate. Um, I would argue that in the absence of a massive redistribution of resources within our health systems and perhaps in our society as a whole, reducing absolute inequalities in mortality or morbidity or other health outcomes is a much more realistic policy goal than reducing relative inequalities in mortality. If you want to see a success of your policies, don't focus on relative inequalities, certainly not only not only on relative inequality, there is a much bigger chance of finding a positive effect when you look at absolute inequalities. There is no country in Europe where relative inequality and mortality have clearly gone down over the past two decades. Absolute inequalities have gone down. Then, in terms of the explanation of this narrowing of absolute inequality and mortality, what we see as the most likely explanation is that this has been population-wide disease prevention and treatment programs. These have done the trick in the case of ischemic heart disease, in the case of smoking on the, on the long run, in the case of minimal mortality. And these have done more to reduce inequality and mortality over the past two decades than national policies that has a, had as their specific aim to reduce health inequalities. So thinking about the future, I think we should also be very careful to, to also make sure that these disease prevention and treatment programs that, that are so powerful in our populations, that they are population-wide, as they must have been in the past. Otherwise, things would not have gone as you've seen today. And then, this is my appetizing conclusion. Depending on the perspective chosen, and I would argue that it's important to also look at absolute inequalities in morbidity or mortality. Depending on the perspective chosen, recent trends in health inequalities are more encouraging than commonly thought. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Johan. That was brilliant. Uh, I'm afraid that time is marching on. On that optimistic note, uh, I'd like to draw this opening session to a close. Uh, the next sessions start in five minutes, so you have time to find out where you're going. Thank you very much.